today's lab, we're going to learn how to use technology to analyze both an analysis of variance problem and a chi-squared test for independence. Recall that both of these deal with categorical variables that have more than two categories, and hence we'll also give you a little bit of a data cleaning tip for dealing with situations where one or more of your categories has too few of observations. So to begin, we have up here the students 15 data set that we've used in previous lab videos. And we're going to start off by uh, doing a chi-squared test for independence. And that is applicable in a situation where you have two categorical variables and you want to see if they're independent or dependent. So we're going to look at the two variables, primary major, and the whether or not a student is international. So if we pull up a quick table, we can see, looking at our data, that there is certainly uh, some evidence of a relationship here. In the business major group, we have a lot of internationals and very few in the other groups. So this is probably a good candidate for, a chi for, for actually finding a dependent relationship. Running a chi-squared test for independence in our studio is fairly simple. You simply take your two-way table and add to the front of it chi-sq.test. And when you run it, you'll notice you get a chi-squared value. Uh, it'll spit out the degrees of freedom and also a p-value, which is extremely low in this case. However, you might also notice that in this case, there's this warning message here. Chi-squared approximation may be accurate, inaccurate. Now, when you get this sort of error message, this typically means that some of your cell counts are too small to sort of assume that the asymptotic chi-squared distribution provides a good approximation. Now, to see why, you can actually store the results of your chi-squared test. We'll store it as a variable ch. Yeah. And when you store the results of a chi-squared test, you can view a lot of different parts of the output. For example, you can view the expected cell counts. Right? And you can see here that in the expected cell counts, we have a pretty low expected cell count for social science, yes, international category. And typically when one of these or more of the one of these is less than five, you will get this warning message in running a chi-squared test. Now in this case, it's close to five, so you might be okay, but just to check, what we might wanna do is go back and drop the social science group and just do a chi-squared test for the business, ECS, and natural science groups. Now to do that, the first step is we're gonna uh, store the results as a new data frame S. We're gonna take our previous data frame S15, and we're going to subset it in the following way. We're going to look at all elements of S15 where primary major is not equal to social science. So notice here the exclamation part equal means not equal to, and then in parentheses I'm putting the name of the group I would like to exclude, and then a comma. And this comma here means that take only the rows in the data frame which meet this condition, that the major is not social science, but include all the different columns in the resulting output. Okay. So now that I have my data frame S, I could run, uh, go back and run a table, a chi-squared test for that one. Right, just deleting the S15 there. And you'll notice, uh-oh, now I've got a real problem. The reason for that is if we actually look at uh, the table for this new data frame S here. Right? So let's go back to where we originally created our table. Somewhere in there. Right, there it is. And let's create a new table for the data frame S. And you'll notice that the issue is that even though we dropped all the social science students, it still includes this category in the table. So whenever you drop a value for a variable in our studio, you have to go through one additional step, which is to run the drop level command on the variable which you dropped levels for. Right. So we're just going to do drop levels s dollar sign primary major. And now if I rerun my table, Notice now the uh, social science group is completely gone. If I go back and run my chi-squared test, I now do not get that annoying error message. And notice that the results really didn't change much. So in this case, it really didn't make too much of a difference. Now, one more trick in dealing with tables of information is that sometimes you might want to not just report the counts, but report like the row percentages or the column percentages. And in such situations, a useful idea can be to store the results of your table 
uh, as something, say, t, okay? And then take t and divide it by either the row sums of t, which we're going to do, right? or you could put col instead of row here for call sums. And when you do this, notice that each entry is converted to a percentage of the row totals. So all the rows add up to one. And here we can clearly see why this there's this dependency here, right? 44% of business majors were international, but it was only about 10% for the other two groups in the sample. Now, another thing you can do with the chi-squared function is actually do a chi-squared goodness of fit test. And recall the right place to do that is when you have a single categorical variable and you'd like to compare it with some hypothesized distribution. So for example, let's suppose that we have our variable major and we have our three groups, business, ECS, and natural science. And we'd like to compare this with a hypothesized distribution that these three majors are equally likely to make up students in Math 37. Right. In that case, we can rerun chi-squared test. The first argument will be the table with just the single variable primary major. And the second will be a vector P of hypothesized probabilities. And you can create that in different ways, but the easiest is just to use the C command. And if we want them to be equally likely, that means that we would want a third of each student to be in each category. So if we run that, Notice in this case, there is extreme deviation from this equality, and that, that's obvious since, of course, there's many more business majors in the class than the other two groups. But if we wanted to do some other hypothesized distribution, like let's say we believe it's a half business, a quarter computer science, and a quarter natural science, we could do that as well. And, and still, in this case, we get quite a lot of deviation from, from those numbers here. The final test you'll need to run in today's lab is an analysis of variance, which you'll recall is useful when you have a numeric variable and you want to compare its mean across several values of a grouping variable. So for example, in our data set, we might wish to see if the average fastest speeds differ across our majors. We can first get an idea about whether or not there's any reason to suspect this using the tapply command, which you may recall from a previous lab, has the syntax numeric variable, comma, grouping variable comma function to apply. And this spits out the mean fastest speed for each of the three groups. And we can see that business has the highest and ECS the lowest. Now to see if these differences are actually significant, the command to run an ANOVA in R is the AOV command. And the syntax for AOV is similar to the t.test syntax from before. So you start off by entering your numeric variable, followed by a tilde, followed by the grouping variable. Now, when you run AOV by itself, you'll notice you get some of these sum of squares and degrees of freedom that we, we talked about in class, but, but no F statistic or P value. If you want to see those, which of course are the important thing for making a decision in your hypothesis test, just add a summary to the beginning of your line. And when you do that, you see that you get this kind of full analysis of variance table that we discussed in class. The first line represents the sum of squares, degrees of freedom, mean squares for the treatment, which in this case is major. And the second line is the sum of squares, mean squares, and degrees of freedom for the residuals or errors in the model. Finally, we have our F statistic and a p-value here, which is extremely high, showing that there these, these differences in sample means, they're really not representative of significant differences in the populations.